In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you, brother. All right, I want you to first of all notice in this passage that Jesus is talking to two groups of people, okay? One are the believers or the, those who would seek Him, the seekers, okay? And then the others are the rejecters. Now, we know that there's a third group of people who haven't rejected Christ, right? But they just haven't yet, you know, believed on Him. They're not really seeking Him yet. But the ones that Jesus is talking to, there's, there's those who are seekers of the truth, and those who are rejectors of the truth. So it gets a little confusing here, but look at verse 30 again, if you will. John 8, 30. It says, As he spake these words, many believed on him. Then said Jesus to those Jews which believed on him, If ye continue in my word, then are ye my disciples indeed. Talking to believers, right? Talking to those who are seeking him. And he says, if you continue my word, then ye are my disciples indeed, and ye shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. All right, just hang in there. You believe in Jesus. You're seeking the truth. Hang in there. The truth will be revealed. It will make you free. But he's talking to believers, right? So then he keeps going. They answered him, we be Abraham's seed. Now, wait a minute. I thought he was talking to believers. Well, no. Now he's going back to the other group. Okay, they is not referring to the believers. It's not, they is referring to those up in 24. Look at verse 24. I said, therefore, unto you that ye shall die in your sins. If, uh, for if ye believe not that I am he, ye shall die in your sins. Aren't you glad you're not going to have to die in your sins? Amen. And guess what? You still have sin. Right. But because you believe Jesus Christ, you're not going to die in your sins. Praise the Lord for that. But these are a group of people that rejected him. They didn't believe in him, so he said, you would die in your sins. Now he's going back, and later on he's going to say, hey, you're, you're of your father the devil. So we know we're not talking about believers. You can't get any clearer that uh, in this pa passage about how you get to heaven by believing. And so, uh, so, but in verse 33, the rejectors, we be Abraham's seed. And we were never in bondage to any man. How sayest thou, ye shall, make, ye shall be made free? Jesus answered them, Verily, verily, I say unto you, Whosoever committeth sin is the servant of sin, and the servant abideth uh, not in the house forever, but the son abideth. If the son therefore shall make you free, ye shall be free indeed. And so uh, go to Matthew chapter 7, if you will. Matthew chapter 7, again. Very similar concept here. You're going to see here those who reject the Word of God and those who are seeking for the truth. Now, again, there is a third group. Those who haven't rejected Him and they're not necessarily seeking Him. Those are the ones we come in contact a lot and we just hope and pray somebody else will go follow up on them or hit that door again. Somehow they'll hear the gospel, but there just hasn't been that drawing inside of them. They don't know that they need Jesus. They haven't, they're not seeking Him, but that doesn't mean they're rejectors. They're reprobate or something. They're just, they're just in, in limbo in that way. But we, in this passage here, he's talking about two different groups. So let's go. You're in uh, chapter 7. Look at verse 6. Give, that, give not that which is holy unto the dogs, neither cast ye your pearls before swine, lest they trample them under their feet and turn again and rend you. Now, this is me just kind of thinking about this text. Others, I don't have any way of actually proving this, but in my mind, I think about this when he uses the dogs and the pigs, okay? There are kind of like two types of reprobates out there, you know, I think of. There's that group that have rejected Christ, and yet they're like the dogs or what the Bible would say is uh, wolves in sheep's clothing, Right? They're of the religious nature. This is, this is my thinking, because a lot of times the Bible uses the dogs and, and, and in terms of, you know, uh, let not a dog go into the temple and all that. And so this is just my thinking. I could be wrong on this. But I see the dog, and then he says, give not that which is holy unto dogs. And so there's association there. I think there's a type of, uh, of reprobate who's rejected God, but they get in there and they act like they're spiritual, and they want to talk about spiritual things. Look, don't even get into a debate with those people. If they reject the gospel, if they reject the truths of God's Word, 
you're given that which is holy to dogs, right? Then you have this other type of reprobate that's like the pig. You know, it's just like, I don't really care. I'm just going to indulge in the flesh and waller in the mud and, and live however I want to. I'm not really embarrassed by it. Look, don't cast your pearls before them because they don't really care. <laughs> don't be trying to preach, you know, uh, righteousness and holiness, right? You know, don't give the cast your pearls before swine. They're going to rend them. I mean, they're going to uh, trample them and rend you. And so, uh, so here are that group of rejectors. We have those in the world, don't we? All right, but then what's he say in verse 8? For everyone that asketh receiveth, and he that seeketh findeth. And to him that knocketh, it shall be open. Isn't that interesting how there's that? He just got on talking about the dogs and the swine. Hey, don't worry about them. But then there's a group of people who are seeking and asking and knocking. And look, if you seek the Lord, you're going to find them. If you're asking the Lord for anything, uh, if any man lacketh wisdom, let him ask of the Lord, right? If you're asking him, he's going to give it to you. If you're seeking, he, you're going to find him, you know. Knock and it shall be open unto you. And so the title of the message is Seeking and Finding. Seeking and Finding. Now, I want to say this. Uh, well, let me, let me uh, look at verse uh, 7 again. <clears throat> Ask and it shall be given you. Seek and ye shall find. Knock and it shall be open unto you. Also, James 4, 8 says, Draw nigh to God and he will draw nigh to you. Cleanse your hands, ye sinners, and purify your hearts, ye double-minded. Okay? This is a principle. Sometimes people feel like, man, God's so far away from me. No, really, I mean, God hasn't moved. He's still there. He knows your life. He knows where you are. He knows what you're doing. But there's this principle where God says, hey, if you want me to come closer to you, you've got to come closer to me. You draw nigh unto me, I'll draw nigh unto you. Okay, now I want to preface this before I go to the first point and say that I do understand as we're giving the gospel to people, sometimes we're going to knock on a door, we're going to get somebody, somebody by surprise, or they're not going to want to listen, and then we're going to kind of just give them a couple more verses and, 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 and kind of whet an appetite that they didn't even know they had. Right, the word of God is powerful, and it can do that. It can hear that, and they can it can begin to draw them. And so, uh, I don't want to say that you know, because Brother Justin and I were having this conversation the other day, and, and it kind of just came to me. I'm not like trying to correct anything. It's just a thought that I had, and I started going with. I was like, you know, most of the time, when someone comes to the Lord, there's a, there's something they're kind of seeking. I, most of the guys in this room, you know, have this testimony of, well, I was seeking the Lord. I was trying to find the truth. I was looking for, I had a desire. I just didn't know what the truth was. And guess what? If you seek, you shall find. Now, most of the people out there are not seeking. Well, at least they don't know that they are. Maybe they hear the gospel. Maybe it begin to de develop an appetite. And then they'll say, you know, see, here's what I believe. I think that I could show you a lot of verses in this, but, uh, but I think there's a principle in the Bible how does God draw all men unto him? Now, the Calvinist uh, will say, you know, God's just going, to, just going to decide who he draws. And he's going to begin to draw them. And no man is going to get saved until God draws them, right? But that's not really what the Bible teaches, right? When Jesus, he said, if I be lifted up, I'll draw all men to me, right? And so we know that, you know, it's his, it's the power of the gospel. It's what he did that draws people to him. And they don't hear that until we preach the gospel. And so the preaching of the word, right, gives people that knowledge and that information. And, in, and then God can begin through the Holy Spirit to begin to draw them. All right. So, so it, it, we have to get the gospel out there, even if we're like, hey, that person's not interested. I do understand. We do need to still give them the gospel. We still need to preach to them. You know, I talked to the uh, kid today. It's hard to tell if he really believed. We've been following up on a lot of people. And there's been a lot of people who said, uh, you know, I, 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 I'm still not sure. Like, I think you got to do the works and all that stuff. And, and, and they just don't seem interested. One was hiding from us today, didn't really want to <laughs> talk. And, and, you know, it's kind of like, oh, the church people are here, <laughs> you know, <laughs> run. And so, you know, I, I don't know. I really don't know if they got saved or not. Now, if they believe in Jesus and they trusted him, they, they're saved, right? If they ask him, if they call on the Lord, the Bible says that, that he'll save them. But I just don't know the heart. I don't know if they were seeking him. I don't know if they really had that drawing or if they were just like, 
you know, I'll just listen to this person because I was taught to be nice and I'll shake my head and, and whenever, whenever they look at you, have you ever trapped somebody? Like you didn't really try to trap them, but you're like, you know, anything you can do? And they're like, and then they're looking at your eyes and they're, oh, no, no, no. <laughs> right? They're, they're waiting for you to feed them the answers. And then they're like, no, I don't know. That doesn't mean that they didn't really believe it. But you understand there's a difference between that and somebody that's like, hey, I want to know. <laughs> How do I get saved? Now, it doesn't mean everyone's going to come to you and say, hey, what must I do to be saved? I wish it was that way, but it's not, okay? But, but so understand me. I'm going to break this into a couple of different points here. The first point is this. If you seek the Lord for salvation, you will find it, okay? If you seek the Lord for salvation, you'll find it. Here's a good example, Acts chapter 8. And I think that this goes a long way in answering the question, what about the people in Africa who've never heard the gospel, right? I suspect if in their heart they're seeking the truth, God's going to reveal it to them somehow. He's going to send a missionary. He's going to, you know, get the internet over there. <laughs> He's going to somehow give them the gospel if they're seeking Him, right? Either way, it's our responsibility to spread the gospel. The gospel's been throughout the whole world. I believe it's going throughout the whole world again more than ever. And uh, people have an opportunity to respond to the gospel. I, I don't know. I don't, I don't understand, uh, you know, I don't understand how that works except to know that, look, if they die in their sins, it's because they didn't believe in Jesus. And there's nothing really that we can do about that except try to preach, preach the gospel to everybody that we can. So what did I say? Uh, Acts chapter 8, look at verse 29. Then the Spirit said unto Philip, Go near and join thyself to this chariot. You say, oh, the Holy Spirit doesn't move that way anymore. Well, maybe not exactly in the same way, but I suspect that the Holy Spirit said to Brother uh, Justin the other day, hey, draw nigh unto those kids there at the gas station, <laughs> right? And he does lead us. Sometimes we don't completely understand why he's leading us or, or why he's asked us to do something, but, you know, we don't know how many people we've impacted, and we, you know, and God would just keep that from us even knowing. Right? There's no reason for us to know. We would just kind of glory in, in our own works, possibly. And so, but he's used you. And if you were faithful to preach his word, we just don't know how God's going to bless it. But he does bless it. But here, the Spirit said to Philip, Go near and join thyself to this chariot. And Philip ran thither to him and heard him read the prophet Isaiah and said, Understandest thou what thou readest? And he said, how can I accept some man should guide me? And he desired Philip that he would come and sit with him. And the place, of the, the place of the scripture which he read was this. He was led as a sheep to the slaughter, and like a lamb dumb before his shearers, so opened he not his mouth. In his humiliation, his judgment was taken away. And who shall declare his, his generation? For his life is taken from the earth. And the eunuch answered Philip and said, I pray thee. Of whom speaketh the prophet this, of himself or some other man? And Philip answered, uh, opened his mouth, and began at the same scripture and preached unto him Jesus. Right? That's the, <laughs> There's no other name under heaven whereby I must be saved. Okay, so he preached unto him Jesus. Acts chapter 10, another great example, Cornelius. Acts chapter 10, verse 21. I won't, I'll just give a few verses here. You're probably familiar with the story. And Peter went down to the men which were sent unto him from Cornelius and said, Behold, I am he whom ye seek. What is the cause wherefore ye are come? And, he, and, and they said, now this is a group that Cornelius sent to them. Cornelius had a vision saying, you know, go seek this man and he's going to tell you uh, uh, the gospel basically. Uh, then Cornelius is centurion, so his, his, uh, the guys that he sent are saying this. He's a just man and one that feareth God and of good report among all the nations of the Jews. He was warned from God by an holy angel to send for thee into the, his house and to hear of thee. Look at verse uh, uh, 43. Now Peter begins preaching to him, To him give all the prophets witness that through his name, whosoever believeth in him shall receive remission of sins. So what's he saying? He's preaching the gospel. 
He's saying, look, Cornelius, you've got a good testimony. You've learned about the way of the Jews. You've got a good standing before them. You're seeking truth. You're seeking righteousness. But there's only one way to be saved, and that's through Jesus Christ. And so he preaches them the gospel. But look, both of these guys were actually seeking. They were seeking. They didn't know what exactly. They didn't know how to get there. They didn't know what the truth was going to be. And God said, hey, I see their heart, and I see that they're seeking truth. And guess what? If you seek the truth, you'll find it. Okay? And so they're seeking him, and he says, here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to send Philip out of nowhere, a man ra- running faster than a chariot. <laughs> right? And he's, I guess, I don't know how fast the chariot was going. And he caught up to him, and he, heard the, and he was able to give him the gospel. God had already been working in his heart. I don't know. Now, he had a Bible in his hand. He had some kind of script, uh, scripture in his hand. Look, that's not something back in those days that you just find laying on the side of the road. Or you'd be shopping at the dollar store and be like, oh, a Bible, you know, I'm going to check that. No, if you had a Bible, you know, there was some religious nature there. And so somehow he had heard, you know, about spiritual things. And somehow he had a desire to look into those spiritual things. And he wanted to know, you know, what is this? The, the eternal life is no doubt in these words. And so I got to know. And so he had to hear a preacher, you know, uh, give him the gospel, but he was seeking. And Cornelius, again, he already was familiar with the Jewish faith. He already knew that there was a God up in heaven and that his, he was a sinful man. You know, so he had to try to please the Lord. Now, we know that doesn't get you to heaven, but, but I think that's where it starts. A lot of people are seeking. They're like, man, I don't want to die and go to hell. You know, I like Brother Nick's testimony. It's like that, that word and the Bible just kept going, uh, going over in his head. You know about hell. And he's like I need to know how to how to not go there. What do I have to do? I mean, do I have to repent of all my sins and start living for the Lord? Obviously, you don't have to do that. But you see how there's a lot of people that that's their first start. I'm talking about a sincere desire to know what do I need to do. That's how I was as a little uh, seven year old kid. You know, I'm like, well, I know that I've told a lie. I know that I've done bad things. I know that God's a and I'm, and if there's a heaven and a hell, how do I know I'm not going to hell? And so I, there was a sense, even as a little kid, of desiring and seeking and, and wanting the well, Lord. I know not everybody's seeking right now, but I'm talking about there are those who reject, and there are those who are seeking, and then there are those who, hey, we're going to give them the gospel and just hope that something will be stirred up in their heart, and they'll be drawn to the Lord. Okay? So in both these cases... Uh, there was somebody who introduced them to the Lord. Let's look at a few verses. Look at John 6, 43. I've already kind of quoted this. John 6, 43. John 6, 43. Jesus therefore answered and said unto them, Murmur not among yourselves. No man can come to me except the Father which hath sent me draw him, and I will raise him up at the last day. Now look, uh, uh, actually, let me see. Let's keep reading. No man can come unto me. What did I just read? Yeah. Uh, Verse 45. It is written in the prophets, and they shall be all taught of God. Every man, therefore, that hath heard and hath learned of the Father cometh unto me. Look at Romans chapter 10. Romans 10. No, let me just read it to you. You're familiar with it. Romans 10, 17. So then faith cometh by hearing and hearing by the word of God, right? God's got to draw, is going to draw men to him, but he uses human instrument. He uses our mouths to preach the word. Or if they're deaf, we use a sign language, whatever. So our word, our spoken expression uh, of the preacher Right? That's who God has ordained to be able to do that. And, and we preach that gospel, and then that draws men to Him, and then they begin to uh, uh, seek Him, and they realize that, hey, faith, uh, only faith is going to save me, faith in Jesus Christ. Okay, so, uh, so that's the Ethiopian eunuch and Cornelius. They both came to Him uh, through faith as they were drawn to Him. Now, why would God keep back the truth from somebody who is seeking it. I mean, that doesn't make any sense, right? If God, if somebody wants to know the will of God, I mean, really wants to know the will of God, why wouldn't God want to show them? It's His will. Why wouldn't He want to show them? And so on salvation, of course, 
you know, Jesus came to seek and to save that which is lost. Obviously, he wants men to be saved. And so if a man in his heart desires, what must I do to be saved? Why would God keep that from him? He won't. And so he's going to use us if we're willing to go preach the gospel. He's going to say, okay, this guy right here, he needs it. Right? And this is why so often we've found that when we're knocking on doors, it's cold, knocking on doors, I don't know what if they were really following along or they weren't or whatever, knocking on a door, door slammed in your face, and you're like, well, at least we did our work. And then on your way back, somebody's walking down the street, that person gets saved. Somebody you see in the car and you talk to them, that person gets saved, right? It's not a coincidence. God knew that person needed to hear the gospel, and they were ready to call on the Lord. And so he sends a person. He's not going to keep back truth from somebody who is seeking it, okay? And again, most of the testimonies in here are from those who said, man, I'm, I'm seeking. I need to know what is the truth. And then God led them to the truth. And now they continue to be seekers of truth. So that brings me to my second point. After salvation, it's the same way, okay? After salvation, we need to seek a right walk with the Lord. I do believe it's possible for someone to get saved, fall away, lose their desire, and stop seeking God's will. That's a dangerous place to be, but it's definitely possible somebody could do that and they'll mess up their lives uh, because they're not seeking the will of God. Now, it's hard to imagine to me, and probably to you, it's hard to imagine somebody, uh, they would seek God and they would get saved. They're seeking salvation. They're seeking the truth. And now that they're saved, this is what everybody tells. Oh, you're just giving people a license to sin, right? You're just telling people, you know, uh, uh, you're just getting them saved. And then they can just go live however they want, right? And it's hard for people to imagine that anybody would just say, yeah, I just want to be saved. Okay, now that I'm saved, I'm just going to, who cares about God? I'm going to do whatever I want. I'm not saying it's not possible. I'm saying it's so hard for us to understand that we begin to teach, and if we're not careful, we'll fall into false doctrine because we'll be like, no, I don't, I don't understand. I, they can't possibly be saved if, they're not, if they don't continue to follow the Lord. But the Bible really doesn't say that. Now, there's some people that can kind of twist it and, and, and make you think that that's what the Bible says, but you got to compare Scripture with Scripture and look at the context, and what you'll find is, the, is that, hey, there are just some knuckleheads out there <laughs> who get saved. And then they're just living in the flesh, and, they, and they, they're, not, they're not seeking the things of God. Okay, but the Bible makes it clear that we are supposed to go on, not just to be saved, but to go on to be disciples, right? Now, that doesn't, it doesn't mean salvation. It means now that you're saved, hey, what can I do to serve my master? What can I do to serve the Lord that saved me? I love him because he first loved me. And that love compels me to do something for him and to, and to you know, uh, maybe go soul and see soul saved. Maybe read my Bible so I can grow in knowledge of his word. Maybe do all, you know, good works, you know. Let men see your good works so they can glorify your father which is in heaven. And so all these are things that we should want to do. We know that, but not everybody does it. So I was thinking about this kind of came to me uh, and I shared it on Facebook. If you're on Facebook, you already saw it probably. That's a little hint. If you want to know what, you know, I'm preaching, you probably could find it on <laughs> online. I don't hide things very well. Okay. But I started, I started thinking about this. I've been to a lot of races, uh, marathons, ultra, well, I never actually ran a marathon. I've ran an ultra marathon, half marathon, and uh, 5Ks and, and various uh, events. Now, I remember people saying, what? You mean you actually have to pay money for those things? <laughs> There's an entry fee, okay? You pay an entry fee, and they're like, oh, are you going to win it? No, I'm not going to win it. <laughs> Why would you want to enter if you're not going to win? Well, I just want to be part of the experience. I'm challenging myself. I'm trying to write it. Okay? But not everybody that actually pays that entry fee is actually going to, you know, place. First place, second place, third place. <laughs> In fact, not everybody who, who uh, in, uh, pays that entry fee is even going to finish the race. I mean, that's just the ma matter of, of it. There's a phrase in the ultra running world, it's more common. It's also in the marathons, you'll see it from time to time. 5K, you know, you can walk that. Anybody can pretty much walk that and get by. But in the ultra running world, it's common to have what's called a DNF, did not finish. Okay, you were still in the race. <laughs> You still got, look at this, you still got the t-shirt. So in other words, I could like not finish the race and I could walk around with this t-shirt 
that says, I was in such and such race, and people would say, oh, you ran that race? Well, I was in that race, <laughs> right? I didn't finish. <laughs> now, I could, uh, you also get a bib number, right? Which means you've got everything you need to be in that race. You've got everything. You've got the bib number, the chip timing. They're going to keep track of your time. You could be in that race. But, you know, not everybody who paid that entry fee, uh, I can tell you by experience, is even going to run in the race. Some people say, yeah, it's too cold out. Some people will say, well, I'm not trained enough. I know I already paid the entry fee, but I'm just not going to go do it. But they still get the T-shirt. They still get the bib. They still get whatever. The after the, the post race spaghetti dinner. They can still sit down and feast on spaghetti if they want, right? Because they're in. <laughs> that fee that fee has already been paid. Now look, in our race, if you will, we've all got a race to run, right? The entry fee has been paid. I didn't pay it. You didn't pay it. Jesus paid it. But not everybody is going to finish. Not everybody's even going to stand up there to the line when everybody else is standing. Everybody's going to go eat the pasta dinner afterwards. <laughs> everybody's going to wear around proudly that T-shirt that says that they are in that famous race. Right? We're, we're all clothed in Christ's righteousness. I could preach a whole message right on that illustration right there. <laughs> so uh, you got the T-shirt. You got the bit. You just didn't get the belt buckle. You just didn't get the trophy, the medal that says, hey, first place, second place, third place. No. Paul says... Let us run that we may obtain that, that prize, right? We're, we're looking unto Jesus, and we're trying to lay aside every weight, and we're trying to run with patience this race that's set before us. Hey, some people are going to get left in the dust. You know, some people, I realize I wasted a lot of years not living uh, as on fire for God as I should have. There are some people living for the Lord way past me, but I'm still in the race, man. I'm still running. <laughs> I'm still trying to do as good as I can from this point on. And this is the race everybody's in. We don't know who's going to finish. There's going to be some DNS still going to heaven. You just raced. You're just, you're, you stunk at your race. <laughs> All right. Look at Matthew 6, 33. 6, pop, uh, popular passage here. Matthew chapter 6. Verse 33. This is the Sermon on the Mount. Uh, who is Jesus? I've said it a thousand times. I'm sure you know. Who was Jesus preaching to on the Sermon on the Mount? And don't tell me Jews only. <laughs> don't say that's just for the Jews and the tribulation saints and, 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 today, and the church doesn't have anything to do with that because that's what some people teach, by the way. Who was he talking to? He was talking to disciples. Now, there was a multitude of people that followed him, but when he preached the Sermon on the Mount, he called unto him his disciples. And he said, well, I'm about to tell you some things, man. You're going to have to forsake all. You're going to have to forgive them that do, do you harm. You're going to have to be persecuted. Hey, blessed are you when you're persecuted. And he's saying all these things to his disciples, those who are going to follow him, not, not just to all who are saved. Saved, they just wanted the bread. They just wanted to get, the he get healing. They just wanted what Jesus had to offer them. Hey, as far as I believe, they're still saved. But he's saying that I want to talk to these disciples, those who are going to move forward, do the work that I've called them to. And here's what he says in Matthew 6, 33. But seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added unto him. What's he talking about? He's talking about clothing, right? He's talking about food. And raiment. I mean, that's pretty much it. He's saying, I'm going to take care of that for you. Don't worry about it. What am I going to do? What am I going to eat? What am I? I'll take care of that for you. What if people persecute me? I'll take care of that for you, right? Because his rewards are much better, right, than that temporary pleasure that we might get from sin. No, we need to seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, right? No matter how hard it might seem, and that's really what the what's going to bring the greatest amount of pleasure, and it's just hard for people to realize that. I was just preaching uh, Sunday night in Iola, and I was talking about this guy that uh, I'm talking about. Uh, actually, that was yesterday night. And I was talking about this guy that I, I went over. He used to come to our church. For, he's been a few times to our church and uh, has always got excuses about why he you know, lives a certain way. And, and he had a salvation testimony, but it wasn't very clear. And I tried really hard to preach to him the gospel, uh, but he didn't seem to get it. And I noticed, man, he just sits out on his porch all the time. And he just sits out there 
listens to rock and roll music, you know, drinks beer and swats flies. As I mean, that is his entire day. He's just sitting there. It just, I don't know, and I, so often I see him there and I'm like, man, what a, what a waste of a life. What a waste of a life. So the other day, you know, I kind of stopped talking to him a little bit. I'm, I'm, I, I'm getting to the point where I feel like, you know, he's a drunkard. He's rejected to some degree the gospel, I think. It's hard to tell, like, you know, uh, based on his testimony. But, uh, but even if he was my brother in Christ, what's the Bible say about drunkards, right? Not even to eat with them, to hang out with them. And so he's, and I'm like, you know, he's a loser. He's just sitting there. I mean, I have a love for him. I like, well, I want him to, to not be that way. But he's, uh, but he's just sits there and I watch him and I'm like, what a waste. So the other day I got done mowing and weeding and the kids, the, the boys were out, sorry, not kids, the boys were out doing some yard work and everything. And, and he stands over there and he's sitting over across from me and he's, he's, he calls out a little bit intoxicated, but not, I mean, he's still, you know, he's making sense when he talked and everything. And he's like, Hey, uh, it's good to see you, um, getting your boys out there working hard. That means you're a good dad. Right. And so uh, he started saying some other things. I couldn't completely understand him because cars are going by. So I walked across the street to sit down and talk to him. And as I began to talk to him, I found out something I didn't know. He said, he said, you know, my wife left me. And he said, uh, and he, he's for a long time, he's been doing this routine of just sitting on the on the porch, drinking, listening to rock and roll music, swatting flies. And he's like, my wife left me the other day and he's talking about this and that and all and all the bad things going on in his life. And I'm, and he's, I'm sitting here looking at him sitting down on his porch, a table right here, a big old can of beer right there. And he looks at that beer and he says, you see this right there? Said, That's the problem. He's like, I can't give it up. And he, put, he turns the thing to me and he says 5.9 or something like that. I don't even know exactly what that, that doesn't mean anything to me. In fact, he said, he said, Look at that. He said, that's a lot of alcohol. He's like, you think you could drink five of those? I was like, I couldn't drink one of those. <laughs> you think you can drink five of those? He's like, I could just sit here and drink five of those like nothing. And I'm looking at him and I'm like, your wife has left you. You've lost everything. He started talking about his kids. He couldn't even remember one of their names. He said they don't want anything to do with them. And he talked about, uh, you know, some other people that don't want anything to do with them. And he's sitting there looking at this beer. And he himself is saying, I gave all that up for this. What a waste. What a waste. Seek ye first the kingdom of God. Amen. Right? You say, oh, no, but I'll lose friends. I won't have as good of a time. I won't be able to part. You, are, you will be happy that you did it. <laughs> and not to mention, when you get through with this life, you'll have laid up treasures. And, and, and what are you laying up whenever you're just sitting on your porch, drinking beer, losing, watching your, everything that you, you own and love just fade away? You know, pray for him if you think about it. Uh, the, the Lord would smite him and get a hold of his heart, and uh, he, would turn, he would turn from that. So seek ye first the kingdom of God. Look, we need to seek wisdom every day of our lives. Uh, the truth, the Bible says, is invaluable i won't read all these but the book of proverbs is just full of them proverbs 23 23 says buy the truth and sell it not also wisdom and instruction and understanding uh, proverbs 3 14 says for the merchandise of it is better than the merchandise of silver and the gain thereof than fine gold proverbs 3 15 she is more precious than rubies and all the things thou canst desire are not to be compared unto her. Look at Matthew chapter 6. You're already in Matthew 7. Matthew chapter 6, verse 19. Lay not up for yourself treasures upon earth, where moth and rust doth corrupt, and where thieves break through and steal. But lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven, where neither moth nor rust doth corrupt, and where thieves do not break through nor steal. Go to chapter 13. Chapter 13, look at verse 44. He said, Again, the kingdom of heaven is like unto a treasure hid in a field, the which when a man hath found, he hideth, and for joy thereof goeth and selleth all that he hath, and buyeth that field. Again, the kingdom of heaven is like unto a merchant man, Seeking goodly pearls, 
who when he had found one pearl of great price, went and sold all that he had and bought it. He said, you know what? All, everything that I have, I'm willing to just give it away for that pearl, right? That pearl is way more precious. Well, the Bible says wisdom, knowledge of God, right? The uh, spiritual things, the kingdom of God, way more valuable than silver, gold, rubies, precious stones, whatever. No, what we need to seek first is kingdom of God is invaluable. I don't mean without value. I mean invaluable as in there, you cannot put a value on it. It's just uh, uh, it's the most precious thing. And that's what we need to seek. That's what we need to buy. Buy the truth and sell it not, you know. Um, I don't know much about the cost of gold right now or the cost of silver. Brother Dan probably knows more about that. But, you know, I could invest in a lot of that kind of stuff and try to lay that up. Maybe later on down the road, it'll be valuable. And so whenever it increases value, I'll say, hey, now's a good time to sell. The, 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 it's worth a whole lot more. No, no. Buy the truth and sell it not. Now, you can, tell, you can share the gospel with people, <laughs> but don't give it up, man. That's the most important thing in life is the truth. So not only do we seek God for salvation, if we seek God for salvation, we'll find it. If we seek a right relationship with God, we seek Him. Let's say we fall into sin, we seek God's mercy, and we seek His favor, and we say, what do I need to do? I just preached on the life of David and Bathsheba, and how afterwards he had to seek, the mer seek mercy from God. And he sought that mercy more than anything. I'll give up anything. I'll be, uh, you know, I'll be made a fool to look like a fool, whatever it takes. I want the favor of God. And so that's what we need to do. And then finally, and I don't have a whole lot to say about this, because uh, I think we're all on the same page for sure. Seeking other seekers. <laughs> seeking other seekers. We're seeking anybody that we're seeking the lost, right? We're going out preaching the gospel and people get saved. Uh, but, you know, the Bible says, you know, pray to the Lord of the harvest that he'll send laborers, right? We are seeking other seekers who will go out and help us to do uh, this job. And look, isn't it good to, be, to have like-minded friends encouraging you, other people who really want to serve the Lord? I mean, I, I think if we tried really hard, we could fill this place up with people who were like, you know, whatever, give me some pizza, give me, some, you know, entertain me a little bit or whatever. No, no, no. We want some people who are going to come and be on fire for the Lord and say, hey, I want to serve alongside with you guys. I want to help not for fame and glory, but for 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 the to, to win the race. Right. And to receive the crown. Sometimes the Lord will send seekers our way, and and, uh, and we can we can help them when they come. Look, you know I, I was I've I, I've shared this lots of times, but I was praying for laborers. I didn't have I felt like I didn't have anybody to help me out. Praying for laborers, they started coming. They started driving an hour and a half, two hours to get to come out. Not because they love my preaching, not because we have a fancy church or a whole lot of great things to offer them, but. I think they sent them because God said, hey, <laughs> this guy needs laborers, all right? I work with you. Never thought I'd start something here in Kansas City, but I feel like that was of the Lord, okay? So we started this. God sent laborers. So then I was praying, God, I appreciate this. Send me laborers in Iola, some local folks, somebody who gets on fire for God. You know, I love the fact that everybody listens to Pastor Stephen Anderson, but it would be kind of nice to have some of my own fruit, <laughs> right? And out of nowhere, this guy, he had been off and out, in and out of, of church and in and out of jail even, and got on drugs and got into trouble. And out of nowhere, man, I, I'm praying, you know, God, just send laborers. And he comes, and, uh, and he's trying to get right with God. Uh, it's hard to tell for me if he was saved or not saved, but I kind of went through everything and made sure he understand. And now he knows for sure he's saved and he preaches the gospel right and all that. But I, it's hard to tell if he was saved and just confused or if he got saved, you know, early on. But nonetheless, we know he's saved now. And and uh, and all of a sudden started having a zeal for the Lord and, and on fire and all that. Look, it's nothing I did except that I'm praying for laborers. God, send me those people. Look, there's seekers out there. There are seekers out there. And, and, and that's what we want. Okay, so we're seeking other seekers so that they can help us in this endeavor. Sometimes the Lord will send us to the seekers, right? I thought we found that with that Paul Wise guy, right? <laughs> I thought we found, hey, that's it, man. God led us to his path, right? Because he needs to be, at the, I still think he needs to be at this work. But uh, there are people out there, they don't know we're here, and God might send us to them. And, uh, and, and sometimes we need to go through a bunch 
of non-seekers. <laughs> you know, we might be filling that map up, and it might half of that map might be red. We'd be like, hey, where are they? Where are they? They're going to be there, right? Just be patient and keep doing the work. And you're going to see those people. You're going to see the workers grow. You're going to see uh, the, us winning that race, if you will. All right, so just remember, there are seekers and there are rejectors. Some rejectors will appear like seekers. We want to watch out for them, okay? Wolves in sheep's clothing. But be a seeker and don't worry too much about what others do. Just go preach the gospel. Live uh, the life God wants you to live. Seek Him first. Run your race. God's going to take care of the rest, man. He's going to bless because why? Because we're seeking His will, and He wants His will to be done. And so if we're seeking that and we're asking for, for Him to give that to us, He's going to do it. Let's pray. Father, thank You uh, so much for the opportunity to be part of a great work. And all over this world, I know there's a great work being done. It's certainly way bigger than uh, the KC Mission. It's certainly way bigger than uh, Iowa Baptist Temple, uh, even bigger than the United States. But all over the world, Lord, people being saved, gospel message being preached. I pray, Lord, that you will help us to do our part and to, uh, to grow to a point where we can do more for you. And I pray in order to do that, Lord, that you would send us laborers. We know the fields are wide at the harvest. So, Father, bless. I pray for your honor and glory. In Jesus' name, amen.